So the official title of my talk is Consumer Products 101. But that's a lie. We're going to talk about something else. So over the next few weeks and months, you're going to have a lot of amazing speakers, just like Chris, come and talk to you about the ins and outs of crypto, right? Everything from the most technical to you know to the business side. We have a bunch of like amazing stuff we have planned for you. This is not one of those. There is nothing here for the, about the next hour about crypto, right? And you might be wondering why are we doing this on the first day, and hopefully by the end of this hour, it'll actually make some sense. So what I'm actually going to do is actually not talk to you about consumer products. I'm going to talk to you about just building great products using something I call the hero's journey. So before that, who am I? I'm Sriram Krishnan. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you books a little bit of my backstory because I think kind of, it, it's kind of important for all of this. I grew up in a small part of India, uh, very, very far, very, very different from anything that we, are, we see over here. Through a bunch of crazy incidents, which I will talk about, I wound up getting a job at Microsoft, which was really my entry into the technology industry. Uh, that led to a role at Facebook, as it was called then, now Meta, in uh, 2013. And for the next 10 years, from Facebook to Snap to then Twitter, I kind of you know, held a variety of sort of roles running ads and product. I was kind of a nerdy Thanos collecting the infinity gauntlet of social media companies, kind of like you know, just going them across them, and ultimately wound up here. And what I kind of wanted to do was, you know, when, you know, when so, some of the folks are putting together this event, like Jeff and others said, hey, come, Shiram, come talk to you, come talk to us about the lessons you have learned over the last 10 years. I, it was a struggle. I was like, well, there's so many crazy things that I've seen, or, you know, I tell people over drinks from my time at Facebook, from my time at Twitter, how do I kind of package it all? Like, what's sort of the unifying theme to all of this that might be useful to the people here? And what I, what I kind of hit upon is something called the hero's journey. How many of you have heard of the term the hero's journey here? Wow, okay, this is a, a smart crowd. All right, okay. Uh, I was going to surprise you with that, but all right. Uh, now, the hero's journey is basically the archetype of pretty much any story that you or I would have seen, from books to uh, movies to TV shows. Uh, and you know, the kind of the foundational work is from this guy named Joseph Campbell. Uh, he came up with something called the monomyth which is the idea that any story from the beginning of time can be deconstructed into a few foundational elements. And it, 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 this could be literature, this could be Shakespeare, this could be Top Gun Maverick. Whatever you see, you can you find these elements in any great story. And what I'm going to try and convince you of over the next hour or so is that all great consumer products also fall into the hero's journey. So, Work with me here. The fundamental elements of the hero's journey, and we'll be digging into all of this, is first, there's a call to adventure, there's a crossing of the threshold, there's a road of trials, and then there's a climax. So what's the call to adventure? Now, this here, you know, and this might be easier for some of the folks in the front, is the opening scenes of two movies. Which two movies? The Matrix and what's the other one? So, right? Historic, iconic opening scenes. You see Neo here taking a nap, he wakes up, or you see Luke climbing out onto the desert planet of Tatooine, and he's like, man, I want to go on an adventure, I don't want to hang out with my uncle and aunt, right? Amazing, historic opening scenes. Has everyone, everybody, has everyone here seen The Matrix and Star Wars? Everyone? Okay. I actually tested on this someday, they hadn't seen it, and then I was like, well, this whole thing's not going to work. Okay. So, amazing, historic opening scenes, right? Agree? Actually, no. These were not the opening scenes of those movies, right? The very first scene in The Matrix is, well, you get this little terminal prompt, and then you get Trinity show up, and she kicks some butt. And then in Star Wars, the opening scene after the whole scroll is you get the cruiser show up, and then you get Darth Vader. Now, why is it that Lucas and the Wachowskis choose to use these in the first few seconds of both movies and not actually those other things which we all know? Any ideas why? Because George Lucas was taking a huge risk when he made Star Wars, and he had no idea whether you would be patient to go see who Luke was, who this guy was, what this planet was. So within the first 30 seconds to a minute, he knew he had to tell you what kind of movie you were going to watch, right? And before you could get into it. So in the first 30 seconds, you have space, 
You have a big battle cruiser, you have lasers, you have light laser swords, you know, you have Darth Vader. It's all within the first two minutes of the movie. So within the first two minutes, all the great movie makers try and tell you what kind of movie you're going to watch. Almost a trailer within the movie itself before the movie actually gets underway. Right? You actually see it in pretty much every great movie. And in my experience, all the great consumer products that I have dealt with do the exact same thing. So again, I'm going to kind of maybe read some of this because it's maybe small for the folks in the back. This is the opening screen of Facebook.com for many, many years, for over half a decade. Now, probably tens of billions of dollars of Facebook's market cap can be attributed to this screen. And an enormous amount of work goes into the screen. But there are a couple of folks who are actually ex-Facebook here. The, I think I know the Friends guys and some others who actually know what I'm talking about. So because on this screen, the many more first when you go to Facebook.com, what do you see? It tells you what Facebook is, go connect with friends, tell, go, uh, post photos, tag, etc. But then if you go look at the right, right, there is almost no way you can mess this up. You, you enter your first name, your last name, it doesn't matter whether your phone number or email, it'll take it. That's not even a confirmed password. You, there is no way you can hit this screen and not know the answers to every single question and then Facebook has you, right? So uh, this, is, this is, by the way, foundational to Facebook. I can't tell you how much effort Huge teams at Facebook put into this. Now, to contrast, uh, by the way, a couple of folks who are ex-Facebook here. Who are they? Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about right here, right? Now, this is Twitter's opening screen from 2010 to 2013, 2014. I'm going rougher take. So I'm going to read out. There is a full name. There is a username. There's a password. There's an email. Ask you to accept a term of service. There's a fatal flaw in this screen. What is it? Yes, why? Yes, right, because what happens is people show up at the screen, the very first thing they see when they enter Twitter, right, they I know my name, I know my email, but then the username, they pause. I have to be funny. I have to pick something nobody knows. Do I pick my real name or do I pick something, an avatar? They don't know, and the moment they start thinking, boom, they are gone, right? They are no longer, like, they are no longer going to watch the rest of your movie, they are bouncing out. So, you know, when you think of building a consumer product, uh, when you're, th or actually really any product, what you want to do is in the first immediate minute, second that somebody hits your product, you want to make it so they can't fail. They actually can actually go use you and they know what you're about. So that's number one. Next up is something I call crossing the threshold. Now, this is where we get to the really fun parts. So again, in any movie, there is a moment, it comes about 20, 30 minutes within a movie, where the hero or the heroine sets off on an adventure. Right? In Star Wars, it's Obi-Wan Kenobi shows up, and he takes off Luke, and they go off with the robots. In Harry Potter, ha Hagrid shows up. Uh, in The Matrix, it's with uh, Morpheus. There's always a scene when the hero can no longer stay in his previous world. He has to go set off on an adventure. And what that's telling you as an audience is, okay, we are, get, we are now off. We are off to the races, right? Shit's going to get real. And for a product, there is actually a very similar dynamic. In every great consumer product, there is something, and there are a lot of names for this, right? Some people call it the aha moment. Some people call it the magic moment. It doesn't really matter. But that is a moment. It doesn't happen immediately. It kind of happens a little bit after when a, your customer, your user, goes from not being retained to being a retained user. They're going to come back. They have figured it out. They have crossed the threshold, and they're not going to leave you. Now. The key thing for you to do when you're all building this, and it's different for every kind of consumer product, is to figure out first where that moment is. Now, Facebook, that moment was you have to get 10 friends in 14 days. So what that meant for Facebook was if you got to 10 friends in 14 days, you had enough people where when you posted something, they would react. Uh, you, you were not alone. You were not posting something into the abyss. If it was over 14 days, people ran out of patience. And if it was less than 10 friends, there was not enough kind of people for you to kind of chat with. So that was kind of like, you know, it was a rule of thumb. It's kind of a good round number. And people like Facebook had like 10 friends in 14 days. And by the way, Instagram, even to this day, has something similar. Now, I'm sure all of you have probably heard of something like this, the magic moment, the aha moment, right? This is not new. But what is new is that inside Facebook or inside any great tech company, what they're trying to do is they're using every single lever they have at their disposal to get you to that magic moment, right? I'll give you an example. So uh, on Facebook how, or Instagram, how many of you have seen people you may know, this place where it gives you suggestions for people you should follow? Every so, very often, you're going to see somebody there where you don't really know them. 
you don't really have a lot of mutuals, right? And you might wonder why they are being suggested to you. And the reason is not because you need a friend, it's because they need a friend to go hit those 10 friends in 14 days. So what Facebook is actually trying to do, it is trading off your experience to basically throw everything it has to get this person to this aha moment. Like by the, the other thing I like to do is if you want to get a little spicy and political, is I like to call it like UBI for new users. Like what do you do to basically pull every lever you can to get your new customer very, very quickly, and it's usually a matter of days, it's not many, many weeks or months, to get across that threshold. Now, this is true of every consumer product, not just for social networks. So, uh, for example, if you go to, say, Uber, right? The magical moment, if you talk to folks at Uber, is when you press a button and a car shows up next to you. Now, this, folks who are young here don't realize this, but in 10 years ago, this was magical. Like, if you lived in San Francisco, like, a cab was never going to show up, and there's going to be a whole thing. You know, it, it, like, you know, the old people here know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, but when you pressed a button and a black car pulled up next to you, you were converted. And so what Uber would do, or other companies would do, was they would throw everything they had with the first time you press that button to get you a car. For example, and that might mean, A, you know, maybe giving that driver an extra incentive. That might mean prioritizing you over somebody else who's already hit that magic moment. Because all that matters is getting a new person to that magic moment. So the idea here is not so much that, you know, to get people to the magic moment. The idea is sometimes you have to make trade-offs. You might have to actively make somebody else's experience worse because you want to prioritize for a new user. And all the great companies find a way doing that. Now, finally, pretty much every dating app also has this. I was going to tell that story, but I was told I had to keep this PG-13. So there is a magic moment in there. So yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll skip that. Now, now, if you hit this magic moment, you have crossed the threshold, right? You have 10 friends, you have some followers, you have, you know, you're using your product, you're, 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 you're kind of weekly in there. You have crossed the threshold. You are now in business uh, with your customers. Now comes kind of like the meat of the challenge of every single company. And in, in, kind of like in jo Joseph Campbell's uh, framework, this was called the road of trials. Now, what I'm going to try and do here is try and tell you some of the trials that you might face. The idea here is I actually don't have the answers. Actually, I might have some, which I'll get to later. But pretty much every consumer company faces some version of these questions. So the idea here is actually the questions are actually sometimes more interesting than the answers itself. The first one is, I like to call it the tangibles versus the intangibles. Uh, how many of you have read the book Seeing Like a State? OK, a bunch of nerdy folks at the back. Now, in, in pretty much a, in, a, in a lot of places in human history, you have an example where some set of people, governments, large tech companies, uh, institutions, try and build a system to capture, influence human behavior. And those systems usually have metrics, they have numbers, but often what they are missing is that human behavior is complicated and messy, and it's hard to capture all of that. And it's a fantastic book. And in every great tech, in, in every tech company, and I can see this across Facebook, across Snap, across Twitter, I've often been in meetings where you have some version of this, where you have one bucket of things which are mathematical, which are quantifiable, where you have a dashboard, you can see numbers go up, you can run an experiment, you can see static results, whether this moved your numbers or not. You're thinking in terms of transactions, you're thinking in terms of DAU, you're thinking in terms of, you know, for example, active wallets. You, you, these are all measurable, quantifiable, right? Uh, that's one bucket. And these have some great advantages, because when you have those, what this means is you can track them, you can measure them, you can run experiments on them. You can be like, I'm going to ship this thing. I'm going to ship a new button. I'm going to ship a new feature. My marketing team is going to try out something new. You can immediately see whether this had any impact on these metrics, right? You run a new ad campaign. Did this, your DAU go up? Did you, you know, uh, 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 did you threw a lever if you're Uber? Did your number of drive, uh, riders or drivers go up? These are great because they are measurable. Now, I also made a bunch of other meetings where a different kind of issues have come up. And in these cases, you have questions like, do people trust us? Do people think we are cool? Is this fun? Is this simple? And the problem with these things is they seem to exist in a totally different realm. Like these exist in the kind of the right brain. They exist in the realm of emotion, feeling, perception. They also have some real challenges because, for example, they are much harder to track. 
you can't run an experiment on them. Like Nike can't run an experiment where it makes you feel differently with a different ad campaign. That is just not possible. These things take a long time to play out. They exist more in the world of creativity, emotion, art, rather than engineering and something quantifiable. Now, by the way, if you want to kind of go even further, uh, you can even have like companies and cultures which fall into these buckets. I want to broadly stereotype, but the ex-Facebook folks agree with me, Facebook falls in the former bucket, right? Like if you have a discussion of Facebook or Amazon internally, people will ask you, what is the metric? What is the data? On the other hand, there are entire amazing companies where you're always talking about emotion and feeling. Apple is a great example, or if you go to the world of luxury, look at LVMH, right? It's all about feeling. Like nobody at Dior is tracking an OKR and running experiments. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is not that one or the other is better. I've been in endless debates where you kind of debate what it is, is that they are both valid, and they are both amazing ways to build companies. But the real flaw is when you don't know which bucket you are in. Right? When you think you're in bucket A, you're in the realm of math and metrics, and, but you're actually, uh, you're actually dealing with something perceptive emotion related, so, or vice versa. Let me give you a couple of examples where a couple of companies have shot themselves in the foot by not knowing which bucket of things they were playing with. So uh, about six, seven years ago, uh, Twitter was going through a bunch of challenging times. And it had a series of leaders come in and out. You know, there's a bunch of stuff in there which I'll, lead, uh, I'll let you folks uh, read in the press. And what every leader would come in and do is they would come in and they would be like, hey, we're going to launch this new product because we think it's the right thing to do. It's going to take a year. We don't really have great maybe data, but a lot of our users seem to say so, and it feels right. And so there's a bunch of products which were launched. There's something called Twitter Moments which was launched. There's something called Twitter Music which was launched. And by the way, they're all amazing people who worked on them. They're all my friends, and they would actually agree with what I say. But the challenge with a lot of that was these were big swings, and they had no metrics or data involved. And so when, when they were launched, like nobody knew why they should work, and nobody could tell when they didn't work also. So what Twitter was actually trying to do was to build something which would reignite growth, which was meant to be in bucket one, but actually using tactics from bucket two, where they're make, trying to make people feel something different. And then they fail. And once you fail and you don't have a metric, you're kind of really screwed, right? So that's an example where they were actually in the wrong bucket and they didn't realize it. The reverse actually happens, I think, at Facebook, where for many, many years, right, like, you know, Facebook uh, didn't know how to track how people felt about it when it came to privacy. Now, how many of you like, have heard stories like Facebook doesn't care about our privacy, Facebook, you know, we can't trust Facebook data. How, have you all heard these stories? Yeah? What was actually happening was Facebook was launching a bunch of product, but there was no graph, no dashboard, which was telling Facebook how did people feel about you. Do they feel that they can trust you? Do they feel that you make them secure? There was nothing. So what meant was people are starting to kind of build up perceptions about Facebook that we couldn't trust them, we couldn't trust Zuckerberg, whatever, but those were not reflected or accounted for you. So you're accumulating debt in the realm of emotion without actually being able to account for it. And so even to this day, you know, if you, what is the number one joke about Facebook? I can't trust with the data. Even to this day, Facebook's paying the price because they were hurting perception because they're only looking at metrics. A different example is Zynga. Uh, how many of you remember Zynga? Okay, I have a lot of friends from Zynga. Zynga was an amazing company. We all played Farmville, Cityville, sent invites to friends, et cetera, right? But an amazing company, Mark is an amazing founder. But if you talk to some of the people from Zynga, the challenge they had as a company was their culture was so oriented towards metrics, right? Making the invites go up, making the usage go up. But the challenge was when they were doing that, they weren't focusing on making games which were fun. And when the, the meta shifted, with, as in the games went from Canvas on Facebook to mobile, they couldn't actually adapt and actually make games that were fun. So that was an example where they were way too much in the first bucket and totally missed out on the second bucket. So now, you might actually be wondering, well, what does this mean for me and what does it mean for a company? I have some ideas later. But you, I, I, every single company I've dealt with usually deals with both of these. And crossing the streams as they stay in uh, Ghostbusters is a fatal flaw. Yeah. Okay, next up, making things easy versus making things difficult. How many of you, if it's folks at the beginning, who knows what that photo from a game is at the top? Anybody? Elden Ring, yeah, what is that? Yes, and what is that photo right there? Yes, great. So uh, that photo is from Elden Ring. Uh, best game of 2022, by the way, highly recommended. Also one of the hardest games people can ever play. 
This is something you see in the first few moments after you actually start playing the game. It's the, one of the first things you see. You don't have you know, much of training, you just get in there. And that character that you see over there is something called a tree sentinel. Doesn't really matter. The only thing you need to remember is like, you can't beat this guy, right? Like, you try, he will wipe the floor with you again and again and again and crush your spirit. And every player who's ever played Elden Ring goes into that. Now, let's think about this for a second. We are all taught as product people to make things easy, to make things fun, to get somebody over the hump as quickly as possible. But right here, you have a consumer product where in the first few seconds, they are crushing your soul. Why do you think they're doing that in the game? Yeah. Yes. They, they, that's right. One, they're trying to tell you what type of game it is, but they're also trying to do something else, right? They're trying to tell you that this game is going to be hard. They're going to tell you that a lot of things in this game are, you can't overcome right away, but they're also doing something else. Like many, many days later or weeks later, when you do come back and beat this guy, it is the most satisfying thing ever. You're like, just stab him, let's like, die, die, die. Because you spent weeks just being crushed by him, and it feels so emotionally satisfying when you have that payoff. So, but if they had made it easy, if they just shown up there and you're like, well, well that guy's gone, never cat about, cat about ever again, you would never have that emotional satisfaction when you actually get there and actually kill him. Now, a bunch of you might wonder, well, what does this mean? I'm actually building a consumer product, I'm not building a game. Turns out this principle of actually injecting difficulty to make something valuable holds true across a lot of consumer products. So for example, up there uh, to the right is one of Snapchat's original screenshots from circa 2011, 2012. So right now, pretty much everybody uses face filters. You can put things on your face. But Snapchat really innovated the idea of having a lens which shows up on your face, and you can actually post content with it. It's actually one of the first companies which ever did that. And the interesting thing about this is that if you use this, there was no tutorial. In fact, Snapchat actually made it deliberately hard for you to use. And there are a couple of interesting reasons why. Number one, since it was hard, you needed to figure it out. And often older people could not figure it out. So Snap was like, we are only for young people. So it kind of excluded people they didn't want. That was number one. But the second part was, when you figure it out, and you often had to do it with a friend, like, and maybe it was a good looking somebody in class that you had an eye on, right? But you had to figure it out with a friend, and all of a sudden, you had a moment of mastery. You were like, aha, I have done something, I have accomplished something, and you felt ownership, you felt mastery. And I think this is such a valuable tool for a lot of consumer products, where a lot of people, I think, you know, think about, hey, how do I just make things easy? But sometimes, as you take people on a journey, there's often more value in making things harder. Another great example, like right now, any of you can go to Facebook and try and create an ad. In the original version of that UI, that was one step. You show up, you give your name, money, whatever, Facebook run an ad for you. Seems reasonable, right? But that actually going to be a really bad move. And if you go right now, there's going to be many, many steps before you can actually run an ad. And the reason is Facebook figured out that when you had multiple steps, people got more invested. They got more committed. They felt like, oh, wait, I'm actually I'm going to have to run this ad campaign now, and I'm going to really, really make it work. And so when they actually did run the ad campaign, you're much more likely to be successful. So when you think about a building consumer product UI, think about how to make things easy or difficult as a tool, and you can move that up and down. You see it in other places too. For example, you know, in, if you go to your, you know, I'll use a crypto example, right? I think one of the interesting problems that a lot of, you know, original wallets had was the, the UI, which could say like, hey, I want to do something very lightweight on this website, was also the UI which said like, you can take all of your money and NFTs from inside my wallet, right? And there was no sense of like, something should be light and something should be hard. So making things difficult is a very interesting tool to denote the heavy weight of the weight of the action, as well as you know, making someone feel mastery and feel emotion. So make things difficult. The, that guy is very satisfying to kill. Next up, and this actually I love this uh, for this group because crypto is actually the best one. Let's talk about when do you make something scarce and when do you make something abundant. So how many of you ever have a Snapchat streak? Okay, a few of you. Okay, a bunch of folks in the back. Great. A Snapchat streak is when you message a friend, and if you message a friend every single day, it's going to tell you, hey, these streaks are alive. By far, the, most, the, the feature that drove the most growth of Snapchat was just this. Streaks was the reason Snapchat grew from almost nothing to having over tens of millions of users, because people would come back every single day and be like, hey, I want to keep my streak alive. The second feature which I find very interesting was something called best friends, which is you go to any single person, and you could see who they're top three best friends were. You can see four, you can see five, you can only see three, 
right? And that meant something. You can't imagine the amount of drama that happens in high school classrooms because somebody's like, wait, I'm not my, your best friends anymore. Like, you know the internet meme, like, you're now dead to me, Sajid is now my new best friend. Like, you would see this play out in real high school classrooms, but because it was only three, it had real meaning. It was very scarce. The reverse of this is LinkedIn. How many of you have been endorsed on LinkedIn? Okay, now, if you go to my LinkedIn profile, there are a lot of people who said very kind things to me, and I'm very grateful, right? They said they, I'm good at VC, social media, blah, blah. But also people who say I'm good at React Native. Nobody should trust me on React Native ever, or cloud computing. And, and the reason, by the way, and I love the people at LinkedIn, and they will agree with me too, is there is no scarcity for you to hand out endorsements. Like, right now, you all could endorse me for pretty much anything you choose, and LinkedIn's not gonna stop you, right? And you can hand out the next person, next person, next person, right? Now, let's imagine an alternative world. Imagine LinkedIn said, hey, you can only nominate one person as the best engineer you've ever, ever worked with, ever, right? And by the way, then you reverse it, and you say, hey, Sriram has been nominated by 10 people as the best engineer they've worked with. Now we're gonna pay attention, right? Because that has scarcity. That has meaning. Now, for years, I've been telling this story, right? I used to tell every single product manager I ever met, but with crypto, and Eddie Lazarin, you know, sometime later, you know, not today, but he's gonna do a talk on this, right? With crypto, this is super interesting because you can actually build these ideas into you know, the network itself, into the way you structure your protocol, into the very nature of your product itself. So for example, uh, you know, the idea of scarcity is no different from saying like, hey, there are only gonna be 10K NFTs, right? There's gonna be the, what the rarity is. So these are actually fascinating concepts discussed in crypto because these can actually be encoded inside code. In a way, I, when I used to talk to like, my old product managers, it was like somebody could make a decision. Now, the really uh, uh, interesting thing to remember here is whatever you pick as scarcity evidence is fine, the only thing you can't do is to change it. Did anybody follow the news about Twitter making blue checks uh, paid for? Yeah? A lot of people got mad. Why did they get mad? Theories, ideas? Yes, yes, people had status, right, uh, with the blue check. You were someone, you meant something in the world, you were happy with yourself, and then anybody could pay $8. Now, by the way, the thing I love about this whole thing is nobody actually wanted to come out and say that they really cared about the status, but that's what they really, really meant. They were like, I really cared about how hard it was, but they couldn't actually say it because it makes them look petty, so you kind of had this alternative battle. So, and but now Meta is gonna do the same thing, but they're gonna make blue checks paid for. Uh, Snap, by the way, launched, announced last week they're gonna make streaks also paid for. So these make people really mad, because what you're doing is you're taking one notion of scarcity, and yes, it is about status, but it means something to people, and you know, applying inflation, right? And people really, really get mad at you. So whatever you do, you can pick scarcity, you, you can pick where you want, but if you change it, you're gonna get people really mad at you. It's always a fun way for me to talk about this story. Now, maybe one of the last bits on this section is listening to your users versus top-down mandate. So the top screenshot is from 2006. Uh, a lot of you are probably you know, too young for this, but when Facebook first launched the newsfeed, there was a huge revolt. Before Newsfeed, Facebook, you had to go. You had to go to every single, per how many of you are on Facebook in 2005? Okay, all the old people here, all right? Yeah, I know, I know. We're all creaky and you know, our knees don't work as much. But back in the day, before you had Newsfeed, you would go to Facebook, and what you would do is you had to go stalk every person. You would go to page by page. You would see what class is this person attending. And there was no idea of a feed where you could actually see, see things you know, pushed you. And about 2006, Facebook launched ADF in Newsfeed because people didn't want to go to every single page. There was a huge revolt. In fact, at one time, I think 70% of Facebook's users were part of a group which said, don't launch Facebook Newsfeed, right? But Facebook was like, we're gonna go with this because the reason is that the people who had high status, the power users of Facebook, didn't want it. But this was important for regular people because regular people were missing out on friends updates and they needed it. And you see this pattern over and over again, where people with high status in your networks, in your communities, in every product, are going to push back against product features you wanna build. But you sometimes will need to do things for the good of the commons. I'll give you another example. The screenshot to the right is from 2016. It's from Lin-Manuel Miranda. Does anyone know who Lin-Manuel Miranda is? Yeah. He wrote Hamilton, he's a musical genius, he was very active on Twitter, and that week, Twitter decided to announce the algorithm. Before that, you went to Twitter, it was reverse chronological. You saw everyone's tweets, who you followed, reverse chronological. Twitter said, hey, we're gonna launch an algorithm, and we are going to decide who you should see. 
RIP Twitter started a trend. By the way, it's not, one of Twitter is one of these weird products where people yell at you using your own product. Like, I don't think, I don't know whether any of you have the dynamic, like, they use your own stuff to tell you, you know, how much of an idiot they think you are. Uh, they might use stronger language. And Lynn manuel Miller actually wrote a poem about how he was going to leave Twitter. It was kind of pretty bad. But it turned out that that feature was the single biggest thing that Twitter did at the time to help save the company. Because what was happening was Twitter was catering only to the powered users. And without the algorithm, they could not get new users content. They could not get them discovered. They could not pull the 10 friends in 14 days, levers. They didn't have any tools, so they needed to do it. And to, even to this day, the best feature Twitter has ever done was launching the algorithm, which at the time was very painful because every single power user of Twitter was against it. So you see this across the board. Uh, you were there for Facebook uh, Messenger, right? Facebook Messenger did this uh, very, very unpopular thing where they split the uh, Messenger app into a separate app. You see this pattern again. The power users hate it. It's actually the good for everybody else. You see the same across Uber, where at, in every city, in every region, Uber or Lyft will have to pick, hey, in this city, do we want to cater to the drivers or the riders? Some cities may be supply constrained. Some cities may be demand constrained. And you'll have to choose. And the key here is you will never be able to make all of your users happy at any given time. You'll have to figure out which side of the marketplace you want to prioritize, and how do you actually get to whatever you, wherever you want to go? Which is kind of the question I think all of you are having. When I was kind of rehearsing this talk, a bunch of people would listen to this, and they'd be like, okay, so this is all great. We have all these challenges, and you know, blah, blah, blah. We get it. It's all funny. But what, what is the answer? Like, what do we do? How do we actually know what the right answers are? And by the way, some of you might also be thinking, hey, we are still getting early, we are start getting started in our companies. Trust me, a year down the road, two years around the road, you're going to have 5 million users, 10 million users, you'll all be hitting some version of this, especially on the consumer side. So how do you actually know what the right answer is? Well, I, mean, I hate to disappoint you, but I don't know. Because these are all hard, complicated questions, and they're so dependent to the kind of product. But I do have two tricks, right? And these two tricks, you know, if Chris fires me today and I have to go back to, you know, uh, uh, you know like trying to get uh, young people to text each other on Snapchat, like these are two tricks I would use. The first one is something called the OODA loop. Anybody here has heard what the OODA loop is? Great, one person, so, or two people. So the OODA loop comes from this guy, uh, that good-looking you know, Air Force guy over there. His name is uh, John Boyd. So he was a colonel in the Air Force uh, a few decades ago. He kind of had like an okay career. But what he did was after he retired, he started studying fighter pilots. And he started studying why certain fighter pilots won dogfights and others didn't. And he invented this whole school of thought for basically winning dogfights, for basically you know, winning like Top Gun fights if you're Tom Cruise. But it turns out it's actually broadly applicable to all schools of life and business. And he came with something called the OODA loop, which stands for observe, orient, detect, act. So you're a pilot, you know, you're Tom Cruise, right? Uh, you see another fighter plane, you first observe what that person is doing. You orient yourself, like what is your speed, your direction, the wind, whatever, but what is that, that enemy fighter pilot coming at, you orient yourself. Third, you decide what you're going to do. Are you going to run away? Are you going to, you know, uh, you know switching to guns out of missiles, right? You're going to make a maneuver. What, you decide what you're going to do. And then finally, you do it. You press the button, you make the turn, you, you, know, you shoot the missile, you do whatever you want to. O O D A, observe, orient, decide, act, right? Kind of makes sense. But here's the really important takeaway for all of you. The key to winning fighter pilot battles and also building great consumer product is your OODA loop has to be quicker than the competition. So for Facebook, the singular thing Facebook did right for all these years was they would iterate on products so quickly, right? So they would observe or even decide act so quickly. So every time they did something, they would get feedback. They'd be like, well, this thing works, this thing doesn't, they would learn, they'll do something again. And what happens is when your loop is faster than your competition, your advantages start compounding. Which is kind of a very simple way of saying, if you don't know what the right answer is, Try and build a system where you can iterate and experiment and learn very, very quickly, because then you will start converging on what the right answer is. Because failure mode is having a bunch of meetings in a conference room and trying to decide what the levers are well. Those never end well. You want to start iterating. You want to start get feedback from the field. You want to get empirical data, qualitative data, and decide what to do. Get your OODA loops fast as you can, and your companies will do really, really well. The second trick I have is something called availability cascades. Also known as maybe 1,000 true friends. How many of you heard the phrase 1,000 true friends? Great. OK, so Chris, by the way, has kind of popularized this, po popularized this a lot. It comes from uh, a guy named Kevin Kelly who helped uh, found uh, Wired. The idea is that any great product, you want to find 
a thousand true fans, kind of a you know, kind of a nice round number of a core community of people. The idea being, if you can kind of find that core community, you can start building off of that. You have something real. It turns out actually there's a bunch of you know, kind of research around this. Uh, I highly recommend this paper by a guy named Timur Karan, which, uh, uh, which Mark Andreessen, uh, who is the founder of uh, the firm I work for, uh, helped also kind of talk about a bit, which basically says that you want to create a shelling point of focus of a bunch of people using your thing, right? So a lot of these decisions that we've been talking about for the last uh, 20 minutes, they are really hard. Like, I don't know what the right answer is. Do you listen to your power users or not? I don't know. Should we launch, you know, uh, should we make it easier for a driver or rider? I don't know. Like, we can have a lot of discussions after this about the specifics. But if you have a core community, right, that is representative of what you want it to be, you can use them because you know, like, how, they, how are they reacting. Uh, uh, use them for feedback, and then you can start building from there. So if you have nothing else, like, what I often wind up telling startups is get to 1,000 people who love what you're doing. Because if you can do that, you can probably have something where you can find adjacency. You can be like, who are people similar to this? What are use cases similar to this? And you can start growing from there. I've never seen the reverse, where somebody has never found 1,000 people who love the product, but they somehow have tens of millions of users. That has never happened. You always have to start with the core, engaged, rapidly, uh, you know, faithful, engaged community. So 1,000 true fans are availability cascades. All right, that's the end of the road of trials. And finally, my favorite part, the climax. So these are two scenes from the climatic scenes from The Matrix and Star Wars. So folks, do you know what the scene is on the left with Neo? What happens there? Stops the bullet. OK. That other scene is from the trench run, uh, in the last sequence of Star Wars, episode four. What happens there? Yeah, yeah, he, he's like, well, this Death Star has a design flaw, boom, and you know, uh, uh, well, uh, we, have, we have a whole backstory there. So these are really important because the real secret to storytelling and this three-act structure is not that the hero beats the enemy. It's not that the hero you know, wins in the climax. That's not really it. The real secret is that the hero overcomes his inner demons and becomes who he needs to be. And in doing so, actually overcomes all the obstacles. So for example, in this case, Neo realizes he is the one, right? And he's been fighting that throughout the movie, but he realizes this, he's like, well, now I can stop bullets. You, Agent Smith, can't do what I'm doing. I can beat you. Same with Luke. What does he do? What does he realize? That, that he can use the force, right? And because of using the force, that's how he's able to kind of get down the trench and actually blow up the Death Star. So in both these sequences, the really the meaningful part, and that's why these scenes work, is not that they beat the bad guys, it's because they become what they were always meant to be. What they were always meant to be. So this is maybe a good segue to the final part of my story. So when I was at Twitter, they were going through a very challenging time. So folks can't see this graph at the back, but Twitter was basically losing users year after year from circa 2016 to 2018. But just to tell you, this is really, really bad if you're a consumer company because the internet is growing every single year. So, so if you're losing users, you have to be extra terrible, right? Because by just growing along with the internet, you would be getting millions of users. You're not even doing that. You're actually declining. So this is really, really bad. And the reason behind this, there are a lot of, by the way, you know, we haven't touched on kind of cultural or you know, organizational, there's a lot of reasons behind this. But one of the reasons was Twitter didn't know what it needed to be. Twitter was like, should we compete with Facebook? Should we compete with Snapchat? Are we for teens? Are we a social network? Are we a messaging product? Or all these are kind of reasonable ideas. But it was not one of those. And what Twitter did, so the second part of this graph, is it actually started growing again, was it realized what it was at its heart. So in 2017, 2018, right, uh, we got new leadership. And we said, hey, Twitter is going to be about two things. Number one, it's going to be about real-time events. When something's happening, it's about talking about it right now. And the second part, it's going to be about conversations. And what's interesting is not that this is what Twitter decided. What's interesting is that like, this saved the company. And growth started going up. Because what Twitter did was like, this is what we needed to be. Just like Neo realized he needed to be one. This is my analogy here, by the way. See how I'm trying to connect this? Yeah? OK. Some of you are impressed. Thank you. Right? Uh, you know, just like Neo realized he was one, Twitter was like, we are going to be about real-time news. We're going to be about conversations. And growth started turning around. So finding sort of what is at the soul or the heart of the, tra or the, heart of the transformation you folks need to do is often at the heart of what makes a great consumer company. Now, I lied when I said that was the end. 
you folks, uh, there's actually one more bit in every story. It's called denouement, which I think is, my, I butcher my French. And in every great story, this is when all the pieces kind of come together. And it's hopefully in an emotionally meaningful way. So I want to go back to the very first slide I showed. This was my story. And the part I kind of skipped over was when I grew up in India, we didn't have much resources. You know, my dad couldn't afford a lot, so we bought a PC. And it was the internet which was the reason I was able to get out. Like without the internet on my dinky little PC, like 99 or 2000, I wouldn't have a career at Microsoft, I wouldn't have gotten to tech, I wouldn't be in front of you folks right now. And it was because I could get on a chat room, I could get on IRC, I could contribute to open source, I could like, use all these like, open internet products. That was the difference between me having, there's a multiverse version of Sriram who has a very different life and a very different career, and one who's been here. So I went through my old trials and tribulations over the next 15 odd years, but the realization I had and was that the open internet and what the spirit of the internet meant was the only reason I ever made it out and was so meaningful to me. So in a way, that brought me to crypto. So a lot of people, a lot of motivations to get into crypto, right? I love the founders that we work with, right? Uh, and, and, and I love all the people we work with. But the heart of it for me, with this was like, this was the reason I was able to have life, career, any measure of success. And in a way, just like every one of these heroes needed to figure out who they really were meant to be, for me, I was like, this is what I was truly meant to do. Right? I was truly, you know, I had to come back here, right? and it's obviously an early journey. Chris talked about how much we have left to build, to, but actually make crypto a thing. Because in, for me, this represents the original promise of the internet. And to be honest, you know, I was trying to think about what I wanted to say to all of you, because I was like, well, these are all, this is a crypto startup school. Like, why am I here talking about consumer products? Right? And the secret or the lie in this talk is like, this talk is really not about consumer products. It's really about life and building companies. And each and every one of you have crossed the threshold because you're right here, right? There's been a call to adventure, you started your company, and you're now here. And to be honest, I don't know what you're gonna face on this road, right? There's gonna be adventures, bad guys, you know, I don't know. And I hope that we all work together for years and years, and I wish you all the best success. But the one thing I maybe wish all of you the most is that you find who you and your companies are really meant to be. Because on that path lies greatness. With that, welcome to Crypto Startup School. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Hi, thank you for sharing. That was a lot of fun. I'm Lucas from Pluragrid, and my question is, in your own hero's journey, what was your uh, magic moment uh, specifically for crypto? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, well, uh, okay, I haven't kind of really shared this in public. I think there was a few, right? One is a lot of people involved. Uh, uh, you know, one is like, you know, I'm not saying this just because I, you know, we, we work with them, but like, I think Chris is really, you know, if there's a hero's journey, you know, Chris was kind of Gandalf being like, hey, you know, hello, hobbits, you know, and blah, 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 and you know, okay, off, coming off with the fireworks and stuff. So Chris was kind of a big part of it. But for me, it is a little bit of uh, trying to set right what I have caused. So, you know, I, I mean, a lot of people, when they think of a crypto VC, I think they think, well, you know, they're here because they may be here to make money. Or, you know, maybe they're here for great, being, building great technology. And all this is true, right? You know, I hope I make a lot of money and I hope I build great technology. But for me, the last 10 years, I was a part of these large centralized companies. And so in some way, I, I went in great hope. I thought, you know, this is the way the internet should work. And I built a lot of these systems. And over the last years, I kind of grew disillusioned with how these companies worked, what they meant for the internet. Like, who, I don't know who asked about Apple or Google and, you know, um, you know the app launch like earlier today, right? Like, like those are, that was not how the internet was supposed to work. We were not supposed to have gatekeepers through which we go through everyone. So for me, you know, it was, I, I sometimes say crypto is like a, a religion where you kind of find your own church or your path. And for me, this was about how do I help set right the things that I might have caused, because I do really believe in the open internet. I do really believe, and I think it was a combination of things. I think it was definitely Chris. I think it was some of the early founders that I got to work with. One of the best parts, by the way, about being a VC is kind of meeting all of you, because you know the secret sauce that nobody tells you is like, you basically get some of the smartest people in the world, and they come talk to you um, without you having to do much. That's amazing. It's, it's such a, it, 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 that's the best part of it. And I got to work with such amazing founders, uh, uh, and we're gonna actually hear from uh, Brian later today, uh, or like Donnie or Bitsky, or so many folks. So, 
there was a bunch, there's not one moment, but there was a lot. But I did realize, I think circa like a year and a half, two ago, where I was like, uh, this was a, a moment that I needed to be a part of, and not from sort of any some career aspirational mode, but just because it was something that the internet and humanity really needed. Hopefully I don't sound too crazy. No, that makes yeah. sense, thank you. And by the way, I think maybe a lot of people here probably have that same journey too. Hey, it's uh, Will from Web3 Analytic. So my question is, you talked about magic moments. How do you, you identify your own as a company? Yeah, good question. Um, and I would say the answer to all of this is, first of all, it's very company dependent, which is very uh, unsatisfying. Uh, there's a few things, right? Like you can take a quantifiable approach, and then you can take a qualitative approach. If you're taking a quantitative approach, right? I have a bunch of metrics tools uh, we can talk about. You want to see, you want to track different cohorts of users. You want to see when, which cohorts are most retained at what point. What? Well, let me back up. What? Uh, who are your best users, uh, and what have they done? And at what point can you predict whether someone's going to be a great user or not? That's the question that you're often trying to answer, which is like, we know these are great customers. We know these were bad customers. What made these customers great? And at what point could we tell they were great customers? Right? So that's kind of the, in English, that's kind of the question you're trying to answer. So if you start with that question, then there are a bunch of quantitative tools you can use and qualitative tools you can use. The quantitative tools are obviously, you can start building cohorts. You can be like, well, how are these people different from those people? They are, are they different in gender? Are they different in what browser they used? Or you know, whether, how they showed up? Like For example, Twitter had this whole problem where Twitter people would come in because of press stories, but they were never great users because they would come in only because of press and they would bounce out. So you kind of have to split it all away. But that's the cart question you're trying to answer. Part of it's also very qualitative. If you talk to Airbnb, Brian Chesky will tell you that they figured out their aha moment was when somebody went into an Airbnb and they were like, oh, this is amazing, right? Like, oh, this is actually very cool. Like, and that moment when you open the door and you see the room and you're like, this is kind of cool. And that was the aha moment. And you might think these are obvious, but these are not, right? Like, for example, somebody could easily say the aha moment is when you book an Airbnb. And that came from Brian and his Nathan and these co-founders talking to a lot of people. So, but I think the question you're often trying to answer is, who are your best customers? And at what time can you predict that they become your best customer? So that's kind of a generic framework. I have a lot of thoughts on this for different kinds of companies. So like anybody here, by the way, I want to say anybody here, we should all grab drinks, chat, and I can sort of break down more specific, but that's kind of the question I'm always trying to answer. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Shuram, Murat here from Primav. Um, we're doing really like hardcore infrastructure. So I've been trying to like map some of the things you yeah. say to what I'm doing. Obviously, you've worked with infrastructure companies at these consumer companies, and you've had to map your thinking to what they're doing and their goals to some degree. One, do you have any kind of general kind of mental models around doing that? And two, how do you think about kind of baking in some of these kind of systemic biases that you can do in Web 2 to kind of get your product better, but in kind of open ways in Web 3 where, you know, if I built some bias into my system to make sure like the newcomer user gets some advantage that would yeah. probably be seen as bad in, in crypto. But I still want some of those benefits for my product. Actually, let me do the reverse part. I yeah. think Web3 has the best answer to this because in the Uber case, by the way, I love Uber as a company, I have lots of friends with that caveat. Like there is no version of Uber where the drivers or the riders are represented on the cap table of Uber. Same with Facebook or Instagram. So one of the, I think, the big things that have happened in the last five, six years was six, seven years ago, the agreement you had with any social network was you come in, you give them content, and they give you eyeballs. That was the deal. That was the compact. But the last two, three years, that has changed. Even before Web3, right, with Cameo or with the adult world, with OnlyFans, the dynamic was, well, that's fine, but we now have creators, and we want to make money, we want to make a living, and like Chris would say, we don't want to give you know, 30, 40% of what we are doing for your platform over to you. So there was no incident alignment. So Web3 actually fixes this. So for example, you know, uh, what you can, if, if, your, if the people who use your platform right, are incentivized in terms of governance and you know, how they own the platform itself, it is in your best interest for new users to show up. Because if you had a power user of Twitter, and Twitter only had 1,000 people, it would die. Right? So if you had like, an ownership on sort of the cap table of Twitter, that would not be good for you. The challenge is right now, 
you are not on the cap table of Twitter, so if you're a power user, your incentives are misaligned with Twitter. Because Twitter can do really well, but it wouldn't be good for you. I mean, it kind of would because you don't want Twitter to really die, but it wouldn't have like a direct impact. The second part was you don't have a direct say in it, right? Like you don't have like real governance, you don't have a way to kind of like represent your voice really. I mean, you could kind of do it in the press. So I think Web3 fixes both of these structurally. This is actually my favorite example to talk about Web3 because in all these marketplace dynamics, you can be like, instead of some set of people sitting in Menlo Park or something to make a quiet decision, you can have real governance. And the second, you know, everybody who uses the system now, you know, has a stake in it. And I think those are very, very uh, uh, profound. So I think Web3 is actually one of the best uh, things about Web3. Um, on the first part, it's a, it's a hard question, I think. Um, one of my favorite Steve Jobs slides of all time is when, uh, after the iPhone keynote, he has a slide where he talks about great companies at the intersection of technology and arts and sciences. Have folks have seen that like slide? That's kind of a, there's a highway or you know, a road street crossing sign there. And I think the best companies are one where the infrastructure team understands what the incentives are um, and they're able to convey what their limitations are. Like for example, the iPhone, right? Like there's an iPhone systems engineering team. When we're doing stuff at Facebook, we had amazing infrastructure teams. And it would be a collaboration where the infrastructure team knew what the incentives were for the product team. And the product team also knew what the limitations were of the infra team. Now, Honestly, I don't have like a silver bullet. Like a lot of this comes down to having great people, you know, people trusting each other, knowing what the capabilities are, and building on top of each other. But it's it, that it's somewhere in there. It's not an easy answer. That helped me contextualize yeah. it. So thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, Jay from Ether ID. Uh, just just the way that you're describing the the hero's journey, it seems like there's a very uh, artistic, uh, like em emotional design process where it almost seems like you have to storyboard each scene of your product. I'm, I'm curious if there are different uh, parts of your background or certain strengths of your traits that made you force sensitive towards uh, seeing this slight of product design. Well, it's a great question. I, I, first of all, I have no artistic skills or story skills. Um, but what I did see is, uh, you know, I think I first spent my formative years of my career in Facebook. Then I went to Snapchat. And Facebook and Snapchat could not have been more different from each other culturally. For example, um, and the ex-Facebook folks we here would know, there are entire reviews and meetings at Facebook where there are only numbers and graphs. Not even, there are no words. Right? You go to Zuck and you'll be like, Here, you know, here's what's happening, blah, 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 and we're going to run this experiment, you're going to change this. Mm -hmm. Then I'll go to Snap. And there are entire meetings where there are no numbers or graphs. It's only images. Right? And it was like a big culture shock for me. So I came up with two things. Like, number one is that there are multiple ways to build great consumer products. So if somebody tells you, hey, this is the one hero's journey, this is the one school of thought that you take from Amazon, Facebook, that is not true. Because I've seen two totally contrast, contrasting cultures all build products with like hundreds of millions of people. So that's uh, one uh, takeaway. The second part of it is I think this can be built, right? Like, you know, and uh, you can either, for example, look at through metric lens, or, or often the answer is just go talk to people. So for example, in Snap, when you would go talk, they spend a lot of time talking to teenagers, and you could sort of intuit out like how people were feeling. I'll give you an example. Like, one of Snap's key things was that uh, when you were at Facebook in 2013, it was like, people are like, well, I don't want my dad and my high school friends all to see this other new person I have become. But with Snap, since everything disappeared after 24 hours, you could say come from a small town and then you go to New York and you've reinvented yourself. We've all been through that, some of us, you know, you kind of, you know, you left school and you're like, well, I'm, I'm no longer that person, I get a new haircut, I've changed my sneakers, I'm like new me. And Snap really leaned into that because they could talk to people. So I think it comes from just talking to people um, and then there's a bunch of metrics, but there's no one right way. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Matt from Narval. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the listening versus mandate in yes. the perspective of Web3, because if your power users are also owners of the network who have governance rights, how do you reconcile like some of the most impactful product decisions have been made against what power users wanted? This is a hard, hard problem. And like to be honest, even in Web2, a lot of great companies have not survived this. Like I told a bunch of these stories where you went against your power users and you survived on the other end. There are a lot of stories where you went against your power users and that was a graveyard. Uh, I, first, I think that's not a great answer. Uh, I think the answer lies somewhere, one, with incentive alignment. I think that phrase is you know, often the secret to things, which is, are your power users incentivized along with you 
incentivized along with the rest of the network. And often when you have debates, what is actually happening is there is incentive misalignment. Like for example, at Twitter, the power users, and including for example, like famous VCs would be like really grumpy at these changes because they just wanted followers and they want to read their stuff. They didn't really care about Twitter growing, right? But if they had been incentive aligned, they'd have been probably better off. The second part of it is I think, you know, figuring out what the right representative, you know, democratic systems are, where everybody has a say in how the network is run. But this is a hard problem, um, you know, and instant element comes at the answer, but these are, we can chat later about the specific situation, but these are, I don't have an easy answer for uh, 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 this situation. Cool, thank you. Hey, it's Emmanuel from Shield. Um, you talked a lot about, basically weighing between listening to your users versus listening to your mandate. So how do you think about when you have competing uh, customer requests or demands, um, and maybe they're conflicting, or you might just not have the bandwidth to, to fulfill them? How do you prioritize? Yeah, good, good question. So for obviously, all these answers are very situation dependent. And you know, we can kind of talk about, I mean, if you're a B2B SaaS company versus you know, a game, versus, these are all very different dynamics. But I think the first one is, it really goes back to the last part I said, which is what is the core thing that is at the heart of your uh, uh, company? Like, and by the way, those core things usually map to some sort of a North Star metric. For example, at Twitter, I'll give you folks a story. Uh, you, everyone here knows what DAU is, daily active users, right? For many years at Twitter, we started measuring, we were measuring also on daily active users. Turns out daily active users is like a very bad metric for Twitter because to your point, it actually had a lot of competing elements in it. Like you could have daily active users who are really angry and really toxic, and they just yelled at people all the time. You could have daily active users who were just talking about their favorite artists and music, right? And they were all merged in. And the problem was when somebody would be like, hey, I want to make a product edition, right? I want to maybe downplay the angry folks, and I want to play up the positive folks. It was very hard to realize how that actually mapped to your actual metric. And the answer there, which was kind of maybe the answer to your question, was that when we hit upon conversations, people talking back and forth to each other, now that gave us a much better rubric. Like, for example, the angry folks didn't really engage in conversation much. I mean, Twitter is still very angry, so very debatable if we succeeded. But it was more about, okay, if you're talking back and forth between people, Odds are you're probably having a more positive conversation. So I think the answer to that, and this is like really the rubric, is uh, do you know what the core thing you're trying to do is? And then do you have some sort of a North Star metric tied to that core thing, right? And if you have that, you can use that to be like, for example, you have two competing um, sets of requests, or two, you're like, well, which one is going to map closer to this metric that I really care about? So like, somewhere in there lies the answer. Clear, thank you. Hi, um, this is Locha from Fuel. We're building a, a affiliate marketing protocol. I uh, wanted to learn more. You, of course, work with these huge companies that build their own ad networks. I yeah. uh, wanted to know a little bit about your vision for the future of you know, ad, the ad ecosystem. Uh, yeah. Uh you know, to be honest, I was very surprised. So I spent a lot of my years working on ad tech in both uh, some of these companies. And to be honest, I thought ad tech was dead uh, and it would never come back. But it's actually come back in some ways in uh, Web3 in a bunch of ways. Because I think what ads are at the heart is you are trying to say, hey, I want to spend some capital, social capital, financial capital, and in return, I want to give you something that you might be interested in. And I want to reward all the people in the middle who want to get it to you, right? And a lot of Web3, Web to ad tech was about who are all the parties. Well, Google is somebody you're kind of searching for, and then you find the exact ad to buy your mattress or buy your airline ticket, and then connecting the dots along in the middle. And I know, of course, this is something you folks are working on too. And I think Web3 you're going to see a lot of this, which is, hey, if you have an influencer and you're running a referral campaign, right? Or if you have a game which wants to send people to some other game, how do you, deserve, how do you attribute credit how do you attribute causality so that then you as sort of a marketing person or you know, somebody who has resources can figure why you have spent resources. Like, I think that's going to be very, it's going to be super important or interesting to Web3. So this is something we, we think a lot about, we talk to a lot of people about. So I think you know, I'm very excited for this in Web3. Awesome. Maybe Thanks. one or two more questions. Hi there, this is Ash from Lockbox for Streamlining Crypto Treasuries. Uh, one thing that you've touched on a lot is finding like the core like soul of what your mm -hmm. company is. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on like a framework that's helped you in your career, maybe in your time at Twitter for finding that like real-time news and conversation was like the core thing that they should be focusing on? Like any sort of rubric or tips when let's say you're juggling between like two or three different features to prioritize that? Yeah. 
Um, it, I, I think th these questions have like both some art and science to it. Right, the science part of it is somewhat easier, right? What you're trying to do is who are your best users? Best in the sense of like who represents a kind of people where if you could kind of clone them like a million times, you'll have an amazing company. And you want to see like what are they doing on the platform? And for example, with Twitter, it was like they're often engaging in healthy conversations. They were, you know, uh, publishing content which people want to read, et cetera, et cetera. So, and there are a lot of metrics and met, you know, frameworks where you can be like, well, uh, uh, what kind of cohort do they represent? How are they dissimilar from other people? How are they similar to other people? And this, you can do that. So look at your best customers, or like, oh, your thousand true fans, and figure out where to build that up. There is also a kind of an artistic part where you kind of just go talk to a lot of people. You talk to a lot of your customers. You see how they live, where they live. Um, and then you kind of build an intuitive understanding of what it is they are uh, trying to do. So for example, uh, with Snap, right? Like I'll give you an example from Snap. Um, if one of the things about Snap lenses, you know folks have seen like the puppy lens or the dog lens which originally came out. The real secret behind those lenses was not that they made you good looking or they were funny. That was good. But the real secret behind those lenses was that people wanted to post a photo of themselves. But if you post a selfie of yourself online, other people would judge you. Like all of you are listening to me right now. I'm, I seem like a reasonable person with really fancy shoes. That's great. But if I go up on Twitter right now and I post 20 selfies of myself, you know, I seem okay. What's up with that guy, right? Because it kind of broke a social contract. So with the lens, you know, Snap intuited that. They were like, well, all these folks just want to post their own photo. But they, when they post a photo, they're afraid of being judged. Right? And once they kind of had the intuitive understanding of talking to a lot of people, they were like, well, okay, let's go build something which gives you a license to post a selfie. And which is, by the way, it sounds kind of trite, but this is really at the heart of Snapchat, which was like, you can post a lens and nobody will judge you because that's a lens. Right? It's really an excuse to post a selfie. So the kind of the roundabout answer is one, you look at your best customers. And you see how are they different, what are they doing, and you extrapolate from there. And you obviously have 1,000 true fans or whatever, so you, can, you have a base to build up. Second, and honestly, most of the time, you just spend a lot of time with them. You talk to them, you see how their lives are, what are their core motivations, and you often build an intuitive understanding of what they are trying to accomplish. And then you put them together, and that's, that's the secret sauce. Right? How you put that together, that's the magic. All right. OK, thanks, everyone. Thank you.